Welcome one, welcome all. Maponga J Live with you on your Sankofa program. If you are anywhere, not here, you are in the wrong place. This is where it is happening on your program where we bring you live information, live conversation with the real people. The whole idea of Sankofa is to allow the African child to look backwards and see the future, looking backwards at the future. A backward reflection with a forward glance. We want to understand exactly where we are coming from as African people, define ourselves as Africans and determine our own destiny as Africans. Too long, we've always heard stories about us, written about us, spoken about us. I mean, who speaks about other people like we're dead? It's like a cow made out of soil that you must move for, because the cow cannot move for itself. But we are here, we are alive, and we are well. We can speak for ourselves. And there's no better time in an African continent to be alive than now. And I'm happy to become part of that history where we are constantly reflecting back where we are coming from. I know some of you out there who are intoxicated with Christianity and Jesus. You are uncomfortable. Drink some water, please. We are not going anywhere. We are going to speak this language until you understand. First, before you become any Christian or anything else, you are an African first. You are human first. You are an African sec second. Then you can become Christian and everything else that follows after that. But I think the way we've been defining ourselves, we've used Eurocentric models of defining ourselves. I would not find a better guest for you tonight to light up this conversation into a blaze of intellectual, soteriological, philosophical, hermeneutical, epistemological, hegemonic, and name it, name it. We, we have a scholar in our midst today, none other than Tate Muloye. Your first name? The, the, Lehasa. Lehasa Muloye. He's a lecturer at the University of uh, UNISA. He's a doctorate student. He's a political analyst in his own right. He's a writer. He's a theologian. He's a philosopher. He's an African reflector, a thought leader, a presenter, a teacher. I don't know. The CV is just too long. I might not be able to go through the whole CV, but I'm so honored today to introduce to you an <coughs> illustrious, an illustrious, well-calibrated and proliferated, if I remember my English very well, proliferated academician who sits in our midst by the name of Lehasa Muloy. And welcome to the show, Ndate Muloy. Introduce us to yourself. Who is Lehasa Muloy? Who's our guy, Ndate Muloy? Uh, Lehasa Muloy was born and bred in Kwakwa. Mm. Uh, there's a small village there called uh, Sebukeng, and uh, he is the last born of Me Malukhulukwe Masikait Muloy, Lentate Stephen Tubazi Muloy. Mm. And is born from a family of seven kids. Okay. And then, yes. Um, seven is a good number. But eight is what we're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. It could okay, be. that's fine. Yes, indeed. Your academic background, where do you go to school in uh, Kwakwa? So um, I want some people out there. I did my primary at uh, the school called Newo Primary School. Mm -hmm. Then I graduated to Mangaung High School. Then I moved to Mampoy. Mampoy. And then this is where, in 1995, mm. um, I completed my metric. Okay. Then from there, from 1996, I came, just like many who grew up within the rural areas, mm -hmm. um, I came to Pretoria. Mm -hmm. um, I had ambitions to pursue uh, legal qualifications. And unfortunately, I was actually rejected at the time by the University of Pretoria. So while riding in a train, uh, a sudden stranger said, why don't you think about uh, dropping off at some station and go to UNISA? And then I thought, okay, that's fine. Let me go there. I got there. And then um, for some reason, I enrolled for political science and African politics as the first two uh, courses that I took mm. and then later on I mayored um, with uh, development uh, studies. Mm -hmm. Then I in 1999 I completed my first uh, degree then going for my honors, going for my masters in 2014 and thereafter I paused for some time 
Because I... Catching your breath a little I bit. I had to have kids in the process. Don't tell me. You started multiplying after up. your own kind. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, and then finally I decided um, to take on the very last qualification, which um, at the moment uh, it is in the process of being submitted. And uh, I mean, I'm excited to have actually worked with uh, one of the prolific scholars, Professor Sabel Onjofu Kacheni. Mm. And also with the assistance of Professor Molifikete Asante mm. um, in Philadelphia at Temple University. And I've had a privilege of uh, sharing moments with them face to face. So I believe that as I'm speaking, without a doubt, I am the uh, product and mm. I've been so much uh, indebted towards the contributions mm. they have made in my I, life. Are you being modest to say I'm a doctorate student? I I I I being modest, you know. <laughs> uh, perhaps maybe I will leave it at that. Yes. Okay. But then um, I've been working at UNISA now. It has been for twenty years. Twenty years. Um, so for the greater part of the time, my reawakening into African consciousness, mm. it is only traceable to the past eight to nine years or so. The mm. rest of the time, I had lived as an agent. Um, that was speaking from dissentedness, uh, from my own identity. Mm. So I was speaking from a imputed false Euro consciousness. Mm. And so the breaking of the slavery chains, mm. uh, the breaking of the padding of the ways with European knowledge systems mm. from within the corridors of the university itself um, created a lot of a challenge mm -hmm. in which at times you lose friends, mm -hmm. but um, you realize, in fact, you were bypassing yourself, mm. teaching what was irrelevant. Mm. So I think um, uh, a long journey that I've basically traveled of a search for who I was mm. and understanding African, understanding myself as an African, mm. brought much of that epistemic confrontation. Mm. And uh, looking at the study guides, I knew from a centered location so, yeah, that's part of the journey that I'm indulging myself into. Wow, wow. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Ndada... Ndade, Lehasa. Lehasa. Lehasa or Lehasa? Lehasa. We have Ndade Lehasa. Lehasa Muloy. All the way from the University of Pretoria. A doctorate student who is going to take us through his journey for the past eight years when he moved his radar from the neo-colonialist, Eurocentric perspective into the greater African indigenous knowledge systems. And I'm so excited. I'm going to pick his brains here and there. He's going to take us through his great academic endeavor, his exploitations in the academic space, his research. And I really want to hear from some of the thinking thought leaders within our continent as to what sort of past are we coming from? Where are we as a continent? And where are we going as an African people? And uh, I, would, I would be very excited to, to, to firstly hear from you, when was the tipping point? Where, where, I mean, you were moving so fast in your career and you reached the moment when you had to put the, pull the handbrake, you know, how to turn a car 360 degrees, where you smash your brakes, pull the handbrake and everything, and the car twists on the freeway. Yes. And you started facing the other direction. Yeah. When was that event when you discovered you were moving so fast but in the wrong direction, you needed to start focusing at stuff that you'd left behind? In fact, I should be specific and by stating that I was born and bred within the Protestant evangelical family and we were the Baptist, I grew up within Malcolm Baptist Church. Mm -hmm and then where I was trained to do the reading. But in the entirety of the journey that I traveled, I always had certain doubts mm. um, about Africa. And you'll always, when you walk in the corners of the streets, have those old men who will always talk about Africa, will talk about ancestors, who will look at the church in a much more Mm. suspicious way mm. but now fast forward more within the confines of the working within the university um, spaces i remember some time eight years ago while doing some printing within my department having a conversation with the newly appointed professor in the department at the time it was professor uh, then he looked at me 
along with one of my colleagues, he said, you guys are not Africans. Wow. Um, like he had egg, just like, arrived like, in the like department. Like an egg on your face. I was so infuriated, such that I said, how dare you say that? You just met me and you reached oh, that conclusion. Me. He said, uh, I know by what you are writing. I can see where you are writing from. Mm. And I think walking into that journey, I then engaged in the reading of a literature to challenge a group of scholars who were called the decolonial scholars. Mm. My intention was basically to disprove their way the of theories. thinking. But as I entered into the manuscript, as I read the history, I realized that in the process, <laughs> I was actually <laughs> the being was being hunted. confronted by the fact that I'm dislocated mm. and I'm thinking from a wrong place. Mm. And I'm engaging on the world without knowing who I am. Wow. So I believe that questions of identity, the question of who am I, mm. becomes very significant. But then at the same time in the process of reading, that's when I encountered the literature uh, or the book written by Professor Malifiket Asante entitled The Afrocentric Manifesto, in which he was dealing with the questions of identity, the questions of culture, the questions of the history, mm. and the questions on the significance of asserting African agency. Mm. And then that book revolutionized Changed you. all of my life. Mm. For the first time, I looked at the discourse that I was teaching of development you already lecture, studies. You already lecture I was that. already a lecturer. Mm. So it is possible sometime to be in the place of learning. Mm but read uncritically. In other words, reading the books that they have written for us. Mm. And you affirm that. About us, but yet without us. Mm. So you read as a passive participant. Mm. You read it with an act of religious mind, mm. the unawoke mind. Mm. You read without asking, who am I in the story? Let me cut you quickly yes. there, because I want you to de delve into that. Define for us what is an African, according, an African, to, according to you. Yes. An African, I would believe or that. Or al whatever you want to call yes. it. Yes. Yeah. Africans are people of the land, are the people of the continent. In other writings, the argument will be that in terms of the time and space, other people who are traceable as of this continent indigenous as the indigenous mm. uh, people and i think perhaps the works of uh Cheikh under the op um plays a very critical role in terms of helping us to 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 dealing with that question why that question is significant is because of an african has been defined from outside mm by other opposing forces. Mm. But in simple way, Africans are the people who are the original inhabitants of the continent themselves. Wow. Number yes. two, take us through the concept of decolonization. What, what, what are they, what are, <coughs> what, if you are supposed to do like a small little thesis outline yes. and someone can say, give us the three, four top items. Yes. If you are supposed to start what we might call a conversation or a yes. discourse in terms of decolonization, I think, what would yes. be the key pinning points, cardinal, pivotal principles that you say if we are to do a decolonization, sure. decolonization project, yes. these are the critical points that we need to be focusing on. I think what, what, what becomes very critical is that when you use the concept D, colonization, uh, it raises the fundamental question of what fundamentally is colonization such that we need to decolonize. decolonize? What are we decolonizing from? And I would also want to add another concept, which I will explain later, mm. which is colonialism mm. and coloniality as a post trauma of it's a colonialism. colonized person. Correct. In which the program of colonization become automated. Mm. Um, as an Afrocentric decolonial scholar, there are three key analytical units. Um, we decolonize mm. the powers that be, which is political structures. Political structures. We decolonize 
the knowledge. Knowledge is in the education. And um, we, 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 we did colonize the ontology, which is mm. the being. Mm -hmm. So um, at the moment, because I work within the framework of education, mm. which is the area where ideas are being planted to reproduce subservient uh, people who become the slaves to the, the system. political system at work. To understand that system, we would need to understand how that system came about. Mm. And my interest will be to delimit the scope and talk about the rise of modern Europe mm. from 1492 mm. as a point at a critical moment in which um, we see Europe becoming a force that ventures mm. into other spaces which they have been labeled mm. as the new world. From their point of view, they have seen it as new, but although these spaces were already occupied by people. Mm. So I think a period from the 15th uh, century, century and then this onward, way. contending mm. uh, European monarchs, in particular um, Portugal yes, and Spain, Spain. Mm. Um, in particular, what also becomes important becomes around that time is the significance of the role of the church, mm -hmm. uh, of Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. uh, Pope Alexandra VI granting the powers for the enslavement of whoever they find in what is the called the new world. Yeah. So the current project of colonialism catapulted through to the 15th century 16th century, mm. 17th century, 18th century, 19th century, mm. till to the 21st mm. century. What has then happened is that we need to then understand that uh, there have been anti-colonial struggles in Africa mm. where we have had, where they talk about the Mau Mau mm -hmm. uh, rebellion. Chimrengas, yes. Ujama. Where, mm. where indeed Africans have been well aware of the encroaching forces and they were fighting that is a state of capture. Mm. So, but what became important for me was that um, that whole project of debunking the encroaching the force mm. catapulted towards the period of the uh, 19th century. Mm. In particular, let me not miss this great moment in the 1700s, where within the Americas, slaves that had actually been captured into the Americas revolted for the very first time in the Southern Hemisphere, mm. what would be labeled as the Haitian Revolution at Haiti. the moment. They're still paying up to date. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a yeah. senior professor with us in the, <laughs> in the house today. We will not let him go. And uh, we are here on your program, Sankofa, looking backwards at the future, uh, looking at some of the elements of history, how that history has affected us yes. as Africans. It's an important conversation. And I know some of you guys have gone to school. While you were going through school, School never went through you. Yes. It's time for serious critical reflections. And we find out where we dropped the ball in the past. With us in the studio today is Lehasa Datemloy from the University of Pretoria in the world of, of South Africa. The University of South Africa yes, in the Department of Ontology, Anthropology, of development, development Studies, Political Analysts, and Philosophy. We'll be right back with you after the break here while we are busy exploring these ideas as to how is the African colonized and how do we decolonize yes. the project. The power to defeat coronavirus is in our hands. Play your part by following these five basic precautions. Regularly wash your hands with soap and water or sanitizer for at least 20 seconds. Maintain a safe distance of at least one and a half meters from people around you. Wear a cloth mask at all times when in public. Always cough or sneeze into your elbow or tissue. If you're an employer, screen your employees daily for symptoms of COVID-19 and where appropriate, refer for testing. Working together, we can beat the coronavirus. A message from government.
Welcome back to your show here with Ntateli Hassamuloi from uh, the Greater University UNISA, University of uh, South Africa, taking us through some paces on the decolonization project. And before we went for a break, I'd thrown a question, and I want you to be specific on the fragments or the subject or subdivisions of decolonization project. What goes into, into this yeah. space? There are many Africans out there who think that because they are working well, they got a flat, they got a house, they got their children in a right school and etc. This whole concept of colonization does not, they actually don't see anything wrong with it. I mean, someone is living in Lusaka, middle class, someone is living in Accra, middle class, someone is living in Lekki, in Nigeria, middle class, two cars outside in sevens. And you begin to talk about decolonization and they are looking at you and said, what's wrong with you? Are you decolonizing us because you have failed to make it in life? What is it with this decolonization project that you can actually identify as being fundamental to the greater African expansion itself and how we must relate to the African continent as Africans. In the words of Stephen Bantu Biko, he blatantly stated that the weapon in the hands of the master is the minds of the colonized. Mm. In the words of Ngugwa Thiong, mm. he struck the chords on decolonizing the mind. When the mind is captured, when the mind is mm. reprogrammed, we need to check who programs the mind. Who writes the software? Who writes that software? Mm. So, in a way, the role of colonial education, I'm dealing here with one aspect, which is decolonizing knowledge, mm. decolonizing epistemology, mm. which is Colonial education in 1953, which was just 10 years after 1948, people such as Ndate Eskia Mpatele knew that apartheid state had gone too far when it created Bantu education. education. Mm. The agenda of Bantu education was to psychologically clone the minds of Africans and to reground them within the foreign ancestry. If you go to the people who studied Bantu education mm. and you ask, what happened in 1652? Without thinking, That's the okay. first thing that comes, Van Riebeck. Chan Van Riebeck. Mm. Right. What happened in 1651? The mind cannot read it. Mm. So in a way, just like... Can I ask you a very serious question? Yes. And be blunt. I will, definitely. And look, I want you to look at the great African continent. Yes. Because many of our political leaders, when they get into power, all they are crying for is a national anthem and a flag. Yes. When you look into the decolonization of education, do you seriously think that African politicians, African modern presidents, African political parties, which are getting into power, have done anything significant? Please put Julius Nyerere on a group of his own. Yes. With the Ujama and the translation of mathematics principles into Swahili. Yes. I, I take off my head to that man. Yes. But I want to look at ANC. I want to look at ZANPF. Yes. I want to look at ZIPRA. I want to look at all political parties. Yes. Are, are African leaders aware of the amount of damage that colonial education with the Bantu slant causes? On the mind of the African, do you really feel and think that the African decolonization project, particularly education, has been effective? It has not been. And it's for this reason that we need to continue to deepen the conversations. One of the biggest crises in Africa is that uh, in 1963, at the launching of OAU, um, with the speech of Kinsler's eye. What we realized is that the 54 nation states created within the continent of Africa were created as a byproduct of the Berlin Conference mm. of 1884-1885. Mm. In my own thinking, African leaders should have found a way of reconstituting the continent Break that down, Chief. From their you own... You are speaking uh, educated language. Okay. Yeah, break it down. When you are saying reconstituting, 
put it bluntly put it bluntly to reconstitute is to recraft mm. the borders of africa mm -hmm. after your own liking to serve your own people to discard the berlin conference what we have at the moment 54 nation states the borders we are talking about are business borders which legitimize berlin now the reason i'm speaking in english is because i'm located in the within the space that was dominated mm. by Greater Britain, mm. Mozambique and Angola who speak in Portuguese. Then you have Francophone Africa. So slaves became cloned into mimicry of the colonizing masters in those areas. Now, one of the biggest crises that we have then had since the aftermath of OAU mm. has been the legitimization mm. of the very borders mm. that were created thus rendering african leaders as the agent of the project of modernity wow so one of the critical arguments that i have is number one neo-colonial ties mm. if i will use the biblical narrative the story of the children of the Israelites in the Bible mm. and the idea of Pharaoh, although it's a bit of a twisted narrative. Mm. The question is when they asked for the children of the Israelites to be released, then the argument was that, as interpreted in the Bible, Pharaoh allowed them to go but not to go too far. Too far. So I think the biggest problem that we actually have is that the very people that are investors in these colonies are the same colonial masters. Mm. Uh, one of the biggest questions that we could actually be asking as a South African is under the heavy, dangerous infection or virus or whatever bacteria mm. of COVID-19, mm. why was it necessary for the minds to be open if the concern? was about health. Who owns the mines in particular? Mm. So you may be brought to a particular discussion of realizing that the world is driven from the capitalistic logic. Mm. So the idea of independence that started in the aftermath of the 1950s, we became independent from what? Mm. So I think Kwame Nkrumah dealt with the question of neocolonialism the last stage of imperialism. Mm. So my argument then would be African leaders continue to be used within the points, within the game that is dominated by Europeans. But at the same time, I'm not simply trying to be dismissive that whether you talk about your Nyerere, whether you talk about Kenneth Kaunda, Mugabe's, Mugabe's mm that they had not, in fact, dealt with this kind of the challenges. The reality is we are dealing with the enemy that keeps on shifting and changing Goalposts. their own mm. colors. So in a way, this remains a struggle. And the other issue that we need to recognize is that we are dealing with a project of global capitalism pushed mm. through the multinational companies. You have your McDonald's, you have your Coca-Colas. Uh, you have your, your, your KFCs. Who are the owners of these enterprises? Mm. So African people thus far still remain slaves within the project of modernity. We have not yet even mm. shifted the terrains. So I think um, uh, what has then happened is that the decolonization project became disciplined mm. by the economic Powerhouse. That was going to be my, that that, 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 that was going to be my second question. So mm -hmm. we have freedom without, without economics. Economy. Let me ask you the second question. Yes. Then. Because if we if we have dealt with the um, with the software issue, which is the academic yes. uh, colonization, which happens from infancy. Yes. From cradle road to kindergarten to primary school, yes. college, university. With different layers. By yes. the time you are graduating, you are actually a coconut. Permanent you are a damage, coconut. Yes. You are brown outside. But uh, the mind that you are working on is a white mind. Yes. That, 
that put aside that it needs to be decolonized yes. in terms of rewriting a, a curriculum yes. that celebrates African history, yes. celebrates African indigenous medicines, celebrates Af African heroes, you know, African literature yeah. and, and historicity and everything that goes in yes. there. On the other side, I want us to move slightly further because in the midst of that, you also mentioned political yes. colonization. Yes. That they were actually, in the back of my mind, I hear yes. you saying, our political leaders are actually custodians yes. of the colonial system. Yes. Basically, they are stooges yes. because they are going into power does not mean they are changing yes. the infrastructure, particularly the DNA, yes. particularly the legal system, yes. which translates itself into the backbone that holds the South African you know, legal governance system in place. Yes. But backdrop of that, I want us to move into the economic deconstruction. Yes. In your own words, in your own word, what will it take for Africa to decolonize itself economically? I think we, we need to accept um, that one of the biggest problems that we have is that it is not as though that African people were not practicing their own economic methods. If you look at the work of uh, Walter Rodney, mm. he wrote a very thick book on how Europe underdeveloped Africa. Mm. He's able to show in the 1600s that African people were using various methods, uh, whether it was it buttery. Mm. But the economies of well, the months. African mm. people um, had certain forms of values within themselves. So currently, we are dealing with a challenge within which the very economics that we are talking about are not our own economics. Mm. They say, by the way, when you read yes. around, they say, our economy, Yes. when, when the politicians are talking, yes. this will affect our economy. Yes. And the other day I was looking at this politician talking and I said, are you sure yes. that you actually have a South, South African yes. economy? Or you are just a custodian of the European economy. True that. I think maybe for me, the other critical aspect was that uh, the critical movement in 1955, which was just the period after the Second World War, of the Bandung Conference, it was one of the most critical moments in which there was a debate about whether to establish the new economic international order to which the Western empires rejected because they had an interest in Africa. What I find very interesting is that that non-aligned kind of a movement, uh, the Asian Tigers saw an opportunity and a hope in Africa. Remember that the biggest debate in the aftermath of 1945 was uh, competing ideologies between the countries that are now decolonizing. Whether will they follow capitalist, or they'll which go is led by Euro North America, mm -hmm. or will they go towards Russia? Towards Russia and socialist. follow communist kind Marx, of a Karl thing. Marx so whatever path you took, you'd mm -hmm. be punished by any of the sides. So the mm -hmm. non-aligned movement, which also was part of the expression of the Bandung Conference, um, perhaps at that point in time, we needed to recognize that there needed to be a way of reconfiguring and rethinking. Uh, new ways of how we deal with the economies. Africa has been described as a place of riches, yet that has so many poor people, which is we are working on a gold mine which we do not own. Perhaps maybe when Kwame Nkrumah was saying, seek ye first the political kingdom mm. and all these other things shall follow. Mm. I think maybe one of the biggest problems is that uh, we are entrapped within the loans that were taken against the African people who are slaves. Mm. So when African politicians moved into the state houses, they find classified information mm. which they should not even touch. When they have actually produced their people uh, success and change, they discover that, uh, in fact, we are much more deeper into slavery. Maybe. One of the critical questions is going to be, is it possible for African people to transcend mm. what we call coloniality? Mm. Maybe through epistemic reconversion into the African soil. Mm. When we deal with the questions of the identity, we are trying to find the soul of an African mm. and how an African interprets even mm. the narration of the economics. Unfortunately, the model of capitalism that we are operating in mm. It's not an African model. We are just running a program. That is why 
uh, economics will be measured in terms of dollars, in terms mm. of pounds. Yans and pounds. So in, in a way, we remain enclaved. So the most uncomfortable thing to embrace is the fact that we have remained in slavery. Mm. Though the physical chains were Haven't taken away, enough. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and we gentlemen, remain captured. Ladies and gentlemen, it's getting heated up in here. <laughs> this is a f for some of you who ran away from school, I'm catching up with you. I'm taking you back to the classroom where we need to start putting all these pieces together so that we understand. By the way, when you understand more clearly, you can follow more closely. You may not understand the greater expanse of your communi co political communication, economic communication, academic communication, and what really are the powers that control? You have an education, you have a qualification, but you're not working. You're not employed. What could be the issues that are going in there? Your presidents that you voted for are in power, but they're not in control. And what, what, what are the dynamics that are working? Who is controlling the strings on top of our African political systems? That's what we are talking about today, and we are debunking this entire system and an African scholar in the house, Lehasa Datemloy from the University of, uh, from the University of uh, South Africa here, yes. having a conversation with us, helping us unpacking some of these serious big words today, epistemology, hegemony, economic uh, subjugation, political affiliations. Hey, write some notes, guys. Because the scholar and get up our back in class. We'll be back right after the break. And the conversation continues as we want to, I want him to pick his, I want to pick his mind as to what kind of Africa do we see ourselves moving into and what are the key pillars that will drive the African continent from where we are right now to where we want to be. Your host is Maponga J. My guest is Lahas Samuloi from the University of South Africa. We'll be back right after the break. The power to defeat coronavirus is in our hands. Play your part by following these five basic precautions. Regularly wash your hands with soap and water or sanitizer for at least 20 seconds. Maintain a safe distance of at least one and a half meters from people around you. Wear a cloth mask at all times when in public. Always cough or sneeze into your elbow or tissue. If you're an employer, screen your employees daily for symptoms of COVID-19 and where appropriate, refer for testing. Working together, we can beat the coronavirus. A message from government. No building is stronger than its foundation and no tree is stronger than its roots. If you don't know where you're coming from, you'll never know where you are. Most likely, you'll never know where you're going. My next question to you, sir. Prehistoric African. The prehistoric Alkebula. Prehistoric Kushite. Or Ethiopian. Who are the black people in the past? Question number one. Question number two. How does that history of the past impact us in the present? And what can we take from that history that will cast us into the future that you see for the African people. And of course, in the words of uh, Marcus Messiah Gavi, he states that the people without the knowledge of their historical past are similarly to a tree without the roots. What are we rooted on? Slaves are people who have no sense of identity, who have no sense of belonging. Mm. And indeed, history will always be written by those who are the victims. Those who are victims, when they retake power, they redefine the history. But on what is that history grounded on? I think it is very important that when you use the nomenclature prehistoric, rather we use uh, pre-European African history. Mm. Um, mm. Africa has always been progressing. 
Africa has always been great. Need I talk about the great pyramids that we see in, in the land of Kemet, mm -hmm. along the sides of the Nile River? Need I talk about uh, the great walls of Zimbabwe? Need I talk about Mapungube? Need I talk about the greater much of the artifacts that Africans have actually mm -hmm. created? The significance of history is that when you conscientize people mm. where they emanate from in terms of their ancestry, mm. it awakens the spirit of a It becomes a spiritual giant. Come on, just come on, say it like say it like in the words history is spiritual. Yes. Yeah. Indeed. And we also that's why I'm saying that it's very much important that our names uh, are rooted in a trajectory and the journey that our ancestors have traveled. Uh, I like one of the most opening story in the book of Mulifi Asante, the Afrocentric Manifesto, where he writes the story of an eagle that was lost from its mother and was trapped in some farm. And after many years, it grew up with the chickens. Mm. It developed the chicken mentality. But its identity in terms of the physiological features it was becoming more and more of an eagle. But unfortunately, the environment was chicken. and its surroundings, was chicken, it developed chicken the chicken mentality until... One day. One day. Come on, preacher. Don't get me started chickens, now. Yeah? The eagles, as they looked down in the chicken farm, they realized one of its own. They flew around the area mm. and screamed out and called out. Whistled out. It outstretched its own wings. Mm. And from that day on, it flew and joined them. And it becomes very significant Wow! that if something is lost, we first look for it where? At home. That mm. talks about regrounding, recentering, mm. where within the historical, cultural, traditional narrative of African people. Mm. As, the awaken, program, awaken, as the program mm. is sunk off, mm. we look back. Mm to take power. In Sesotho, we say, mm. So in the same way, what it simply means is that we have to have a clear consciousness that we are created in the image mm. of our own ancestors. We became disrupted. Mm. But that unbroken fellowship mm. needs to be restored. Mm. When the knee mm has disjointed from the knee curb. Mm. You limp when you walk. Mm. That speaks to the fractured mind. Mm. That speaks to the tortuous awareness. Mm. So what actually happens is that African people have been great. African people have been living their lives. Mm. African people mm. have been solving. African people have always had their own institutions. Mm. African people have always had their own understanding mm. of the relationship between the living I will not and the I will not So it you, is very significant. I will not let you go. We have to be crowned. I will not let you go before I poke your mind <laughs> on, the, on the involvement of Christianity on the colonization of the African mind. Yes. I would, I would, I would have failed because I think um, the greater masses of our continent actually has become so religious, yes. so religious that they are prepared to spend... Uh, seven hours on a Sunday, yes. two hours, three hours on a Monday, four hours on a Tuesday on a choir, five hours on a Wednesday on women's ministries, seven hours on, an, on Thursday, another five, three, four hours on Friday, another six hours on Saturday. And church has become a prime. I know that churches are selling hope to the people who are hopeless, who have failed and life to them, politics and economics has failed. And the only place which tells them that they are worth something is the church, but this is post. Yes. I want us to look prior yes. and how this concept of Christianity, particularly church, including Islam, has actually been able to carve itself into a model where the African now finds the only solace in the midst of such despondency from all other institutions. How has spirituality played its hand into the colonization of the African mind? Every political system has its own spiritual subtext. Mm -hmm. Spirituality, it's a cultural expression. Mm. The same way the Arab invasion in Africa ushered in Islam. Mm. In the worst, Euro narrative of the project of spirituality, 
ushered in Jesus. the idea mm. of Jesus. I would like to call it the, the idea of Jesus. So in a way, um, spirituality speaks not only to the physical, but to the relationship with the metaphysical. Mm. So um, it is a war of the snatching of the souls. Mm. When political through, uh, powers through the military was rippling the African mineral resources, the role of evangelical missionaries was to reap apart African souls. Come on, preacher. Now, what becomes hey, important? Hold me now. What becomes important to understand is the fact that any form of spirituality that demands you to convert, mm -hmm. conversion is a political statement. Mm. Uh, the critical question here. It's not the question of whether African people do not believe in the supernaturals. Mm. Every we society, every society within time and space, has its own mythological narrative mm. of how the world came to be. But mm. what we have a problem, it's when the stories of those that are colonized mm. are subjected to a non-entity mm. by those who are imposing their own narrative of God. Mm. So spirituality becomes a critical issue. In fact, our war, our fundamental war in Africa and the last enemy to be conquered, mm. it is a foreign concept of, of God. God. Put, put three dots right there. Yes. Put three dots right there. Allow me to take you on a roller coaster. Yes. For the last uh, three, four minutes of our show. Ndate uh, lihasa muloi. Muloi. Ndate lihasa muloi. You are now the president of Africa. Tell me three things that you will do. Um, One. I, I think... Shoot quickly like boom, boom, boom. I think if I were an African You dictator, are the president of Africa. Come on, chief. You may know I'm not... You I will are without a doubt destroy... One. European statues that have been imputed... Get rid of to all the statues. the memories of the African ancestors which they have killed. Beautiful. Number two. I will establish African enshrines and moments to call a day of repentance of the African people mm -hmm. to turn away because we are worshipping the false gods, to turn back to our own ancestors. Go back to our own ancestors. First one, get rid of our monuments. Secondly, take people back to their ancestors, take people back to their spirituality. Number three. And then what I will then do will be to deal with the question of African knowledge knowledge systems and ask african people to say there was nothing wrong with them mm. and what they knew other than they were violated education when you come back for our last segment we'll be getting our closing remarks from our honorable uh astute and uh, proliferated uh, uh, he, will be, he will be submitting his thesis in the next two weeks let me call you a doctor on this show <laughs> because you are getting there anyhow after the break we'll be back to pick up the final remarks from our honorable guest here on your program sankofa with Ntatele hassam loi from the university of uh, south africa unisa don't go away don't touch that remote we'll be back right after the break Hello. Being a legal practitioner in South Africa in these challenging times demands lawyers that will help clients beyond legal issues. The ever-changing demands in commerce and tourism require lawyers who have sound and clear business and commercial knowledge. And that's where MB Chava Good Incorporated comes in. Our business, mining, tourism, health, labor, and economic knowledge encapsulated with law and litigation experience gives us an advantage in the legal sphere. Our experience in assisting businesses, government, and various industries with their needs puts us amongst the many progressive 
and striving law firms in South Africa. Now, to contact our attorneys for assistance with any of the mentioned fields and others, please call us on 012-341-4187 or send us an email on admin at chabanku.co.za and be Chabanku Incorporated, where problems meet solutions. Virus outbreak. Experience the extraordinary. Tremendous waste and tremendous fraud. Mexico is, in fact, you will soon find out. It is a day to celebrate. We don't approve at all what's going on. Well, I don't know if it's necessarily unusual. Challenge your ordinary. Not only the government, the municipality here has had no plan. Experience the extraordinary with Starset. There's no better place to be than to be right here with me here on Sankofa on your program here looking backwards and seeing the future. If you missed us on the first three, four, five uh, you know, segments that we've had, I suggest go back to our websites, go back to our YouTube channels, scroll back and listen. The conversation today has been lit. I'm speaking like a young man now. It has been lit with one of the leading thought leaders in South Africa here on the greater space of philosophy and the greater space again of African decolonization project. I heard you just before the break talking about the issue of, um, of statues and their removal. I mean, we have problems of poverty. We have problems of unemployment. We have problems of um, you know, you know, you know, you know, poor water, poor schools. Why are you so obsessed with removing statues and changing names of, of townships? When people are starving, how important is removing Paul Kruger from Pretoria Central vis-a-vis -vis supplying a bucket of food for the people in Alexandria? You earlier asked the question of spirituality. Statues are not just standing monuments. They have a significant role in the control of the metaphysical realm. Statues are a living and sealment of eternal victories. Why do we change and drop the old flag of apartheid to lift up the new one, yet the statues Remain. are still standing? What do they symbolize? I hear you. For example, I can speak of the statue of Paul Kruger at the center of Pretoria. Below that statue, you have the images of the people holding the guns. Who were they killing? I think it is very critical that those who are victimized when they take power, mm. they should redefine mm. the art of the game. Mm. So mm. the statues that are standing symbolize a standing order. Mm. Who will kill you? Why you. is it that we claim to be free? You even go right now to Pretoria, right at the center. You see this huge figure. European figure. Standing. It occupies the space. It is even fenced. What are we protecting? It is a protection of the, the legacy. legacy. It is a protection of the achievements made. African people remain spiritually captured because of the significance of the statues. Young people in what would have been thought as a Model C Institute, mm. University in Cape Town, UCT, mm. understood this when they were removing the statue of Rhodes. At the University of Cape Town? Yes. Pull him down. So I'm saying... I want to also challenge that Zimbabwe, if you go to Zimbabwe right now, Victoria Falls, yes. there's David Livingstone yes. standing right there yes. next to Mosi Atunya. I want to make a declaration. I want to push him into the river. Yes. He does not belong there. Yes. I'm looking at Matopos. Yes. Where Sister John Roth's bones. Yes. To date, Mugabe was joking the other day. Yes. You guys are fighting with the statue. We are fighting with the bones. Yes. 
remove those bones because he was actually buried yes. at the Zimbabwe National Spiritual Shrine to of, cut the lineage of of, of, of um, uh, you know uh, uh, my, my, they call it but Matopos. Yes. Which works as a spiritual shrine of Zimbabwe. Yes. And Rose decided to bury himself there. Yes. And we no longer have access to that shrine because there's a white man that is buried there. Yes. So I hear you that these statues symbolize spiritual presence. They do. I, I want to throw you one last question. In yes. one minute exactly, the last two minutes are mine. One minute exactly. Here we are in South Africa. Let's make it more contemporary. If you had an advice to give to our honorable Sidio Ramaphosa in the backdrop of coronavirus, and the greater new age we are moving into. What would you want to tell South Africa as the president of South Africa yourself? I think it is important, number one, to recognize the scourge and the ravage that has actually been caused. Um, in particular, at an economic level, you know, for survival of the families, mm. Um, it is a pivotal moment of asking critical questions as we have raised about who we are. African people were also people who were farmers, who were self-dependent. We have so much, some of us are calling for the land, which we are not even interested to build a relationship with and to plow with. We need to re-examine the model of cash economy. Mm. Um, we go and buy things that we can still be able to, to plant. So perhaps it becomes very important to become aware that we need to redevelop mm. a different way of looking at life. We need to resuscitate. So the question of land should not just be the earth crust. Mm. We should look at the land as a very productive resource. What knowledge do we actually have to survive mm. on that? Um, what I'm careful of not trying to ignore is the fact that we have lived as dependent people who look for a job under this model. Mm. But perhaps maybe uh, my thinking would also be to the president, rethinking the structure and the issue of education mm -hmm. to help Africans to babele tabuluho. Uh, of the mind through a relevant um, education that helps them to build relationship. We plant food on the land. Mm. We, 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 we live on the land. Mm. Uh, do we have a kind of a knowledge system that helps us to understand mm. what this land is? And, and I think that becomes very critical uh, uh, for me to say that uh, somebody was saying one time that when young people who like wearing shining clothes mm. Um, who drink Moye and your mm. begin talking about the land, I become very worried. Okay. So I think it is important, therefore, to suggest that we need to come to the place mm. where our education system needs to restore our minds mm. and to help us, looking back in history, to begin to look to ourselves and look into for the our own strength. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard from yourself. This man, I'm going to bring him back again on your program, Sankofa, having a uh, thorough conversation around the greater reconstruction of the African narrative, writing our own stories for ourselves. We're here to rewrite the history for the future that is coming. On your program, Sankofa, your host for this evening, you had it for yourself. Do something with yourself. Read, study, learn, unlearn, educate, uneducate, construct, deconstruct, you know, and do everything to learn. And your host tonight, None other than Maponga Jane. Did Maponga Jeshu Mwana Omchena Mwana Marara Chigara Mboko Gara Mashamba Huda Chira Nawa 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 Njiba Na Chigara Matombo Mawke Ya Novo Ra Chigwe Chiti Zashi Nukubwa Nawa Nawa Mawa Nawa Pedi Wana Tamba Nacho Shina Mbaku Sesera Mpona Ngo Kuba Wana Mtambo Duparu Ware Until we see you again It has been a wonderful, wonderful evening in your program Sankofa, our host Maponga J, our guest for tonight Li Hasa Muloi Until we see you again Enjoy yourselves and give yourself a wonderful evening. Don't do what I wouldn't what I wouldn't do. If you do it, do it better. Hello. Being a legal practitioner in South Africa in these challenging times demands lawyers that will help clients beyond legal issues. The ever-changing demands in commerce and tourism require lawyers who have sound and clear business and commercial knowledge. And that's where MB Chabangu Incorporated comes in. Our business, mining, tourism, health, labor 
and economic knowledge encapsulated with law and litigation experience gives us an advantage in the legal sphere. Our experience in assisting businesses, government, and various industries with their needs puts us amongst the many progressive and striving law firms in South Africa. Now, to contact our attorneys for assistance with any of the mentioned fields and others, please call us on 012-341-4187 or send us an email on admin at chabanku.co.za and be Chabanku Incorporated, where problems meet solutions.